Good Friday morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you were able to join the last couple of weeks with our fabulous guest speakers. And since my last appearance uh, with the Red Wing Blackbirds, people in this world have celebrated St. Patrick's Day, Maha Shivaratri, and we moved the clocks forward to the de detriment of anyone with young kids. Tomorrow marks the beginning of Passover, and Sunday marks the beginning of Holy, the Hindu festival of love and spring. We also mark the beginning of astronomical spring with the spring equinox, which is the great equalizer when the sun rises due east for everyone on the planet and everyone witnessed 12 hours of light and 12 hours of day of dark. Yeah, whatever the opposite of light is. And uh, if you live at the North Pole, you're about to get six months of daylight and the South Pole is tucking in for six months of darkness. Today's talk is on clouds, something that I think most people on the planet can see at least seasonally, almost no matter where you live. And uh, to me, clouds are one of the most important things that we probably don't often think about too much. And, and that doesn't mean we don't notice clouds or pay attention, but it's easy to kind of not pay attention to, if that makes sense. Uh, but at a very basic level, clouds can, can help you survive if you pay attention to them. They, they affect your mood. They give you respite from that super hot sphere of gas that we call the sun. Uh, but most importantly to me, they add color and shape and aesthetics to our world. The Backyard Naturalist is part of the UEC In My Backyard, which is starting to wind down a little bit in terms of new content as, as the Urban Ecology Center makes a transition to more in-person programming. But the Backyard Naturalist will continue. And again, my deepest thanks to subscribers, uh, also members of the Urban Ecology Center for the rest of this calendar year, thanks to our community partner, Eric's Bike Shop. Uh, you get a 10% discount on most in-store purchases. Thankfully, though, there, uh, there is still some great new content being produced for the UEC in my backyard, uh, including a couple new entries in Spanish from Miguel Santos, uh, who will be a backyard naturalist guest at the end of April. Uh, this, there are no videos in this uh, lecture, so we will, we will do a short our, our trailer will be a video uh, that Miguel produced. Um, he, he did a, a little video on how to make a barometer at home, and this short lesson is on air pressure. So today's trailer will be in Spanish, but there are subtitles, and it's also a very fitting introduction to a talk on clouds. So we'll enjoy the ever soothing voice of Miguel and um, also listen to his wise, wise words. <laughs> del Urban Ecology Center, ¿cómo están? Veo que están aprendiendo del tiempo, un tema muy interesante. Ya saben que hay cuatro ingredientes o elementos importantes para que el tiempo cambie y uno muy fundamental es la presión atmosférica. Ya saben que el planeta Tierra tiene una masa de aire llamada atmósfera y esa atmósfera en ocasiones pesa más o pesa menos. La presión atmosférica es el peso del de aire que nos rodea. Deben pensar, Mr. Miguel, no sé, ¿cuánto pesa el aire? El aire no pesa mucho. En realidad sí pesa. Y vamos a comprender que esos cambios de peso en el aire determinan un cielo despejado y sol o, por el contrario, nubes y precipitación lluvia, nieve, granizo, etc. ¿Qué ocurre? En ocasiones tenemos zonas con una presión alta. ¿Qué significa una presión alta? Como su nombre indica, alto es que el aire pesa mucho. Y imagínense una especie de secador que está empujando el aire hacia abajo. Hay masas de aire que pesan mucho y como es mucho el peso disipa toda el agua que haya en el aire, es decir, la empuja, todo ese agua del aire la empuja, desaparecen las nubes, desaparece la lluvia, desaparece la nieve y es cuando hay un cielo azul despejado y sol. 
Y a eso se le llama presión alta. High pressure. Que habrán visto en el pronóstico del tiempo. En ocasiones ocurre justamente lo contrario. No que el aire empuje hacia abajo porque es muy pesado, sino que en ocasiones el aire es ligero y como es ligero sube hacia arriba y al subir hacia arriba se enfría y se condensa. Esa poquita agua que había en el aire la va a transformar en nubes y finalmente en precipitación, en lluvia, nieve y a eso se le llama presión baja o low pressure, low pressure. Recuerden, high pressure, happy weather, buen tiempo, low pressure, presión baja, lousy weather, mal tiempo. Y esto está cambiando continuamente porque la presión siempre cambia de presión alta a presión baja y luego presión alta hacia presión baja y así, 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 sin parar. Espero que hayan comprendido la diferencia entre presión alta y presión baja. Continúen explorando. Adiós amigos, hasta pronto. All right. Thank you, Miguel. So that was a great introduction to really all of these concepts that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, this is the first time that we are not featuring a living organism in, in the Backyard Naturalist. Uh, in season one, we did look at the smell of rain, but even that one featured bacteria and our friends, the springtails. So since ecology looks at the intersection of the living and non-living components of our natural spaces, including our backyards, This episode will focus on a major element of the non-living world, which of course then directly affects the living world uh, and not just by providing us with fresh water. I would like to acknowledge my primary sources of information for the episode, The Great Ologies with Ellie Ward, interviewing nephologist, Dr. Rachel Storr. Nephology is the study of clouds, neph with a Greek root meaning cloud, uh, and also the folks at Stuff You Should Know, and a great New York Times article on the Cloud Appreciation Society. Clouds are one of those topics where it's best to go back to our grade school science course and a very simple in theory, but complex in practice concept, uh, which is the water cycle. So imagine you just flew to a Caribbean island or you're hanging out with Jen in Florida and you wake up, you have breakfast, uh, you go out to your patio to practice this serenity and you've got a, a cup of iced coffee or hot tea, and you start to feel the warmth of the sun on your sunscreen skin, of course, or your clothes, or things around you, particularly dark objects, all of those things and the land itself is turning that sun's energy into heat, which is warming the air. It's humid, so the air is already full of moisture, but that sun's energy is putting more moisture into the air through evaporation of any standing water, And the heat allows the air to capture even more moisture because uh, warm air, the hotter the air, the more moisture it can hold. Warm air is less dense. That humid warm air starts to rise and it moves up into the colder areas of the atmosphere, uh, which then starts to cool the air. And cold air does not hold moisture as well as hot air. So the moisture starts to condense. Just like if you put a cold can of soda outside on a hot day, that air right around that can will cool and the moisture will condense out of that air, which forms those beads of water. Except for in the case of clouds, instead of forming on a soda can, uh, we get condensation in the air as clouds. So if there's one thing I remember from Caitlin's tree lecture, it's that water molecules love to hang out with other water molecules. And as more moisture is added with the sun, These tiny droplets of condensation start bumping into each other and they form larger droplets of condensation. And up until now, these tiny droplets are so light that they're kept aloft by the air currents and that rising air. But at some point they get too large and too heavy to be held aloft. So they fall down as precipitation. Water that falls is either absorbed back into the air or accumulates into groundwater, puddles, lakes, oceans, and the process starts all over again. So. 
Uh, in the tropics, because of this simple system, it's very common to have sunny, hot mornings that lead to afternoon thunderstorms as kind of a fairly regular pattern, uh, depending on where you are. If you take this simple concept and then apply it more generally on a global scale, uh, you start to get a basic understanding of, of these general global weather patterns. So, uh, so this illustration is not how it works on Earth, but it's kind of a good starting concept uh, to understand these, these general drivers of weather on Earth. So you see that the hottest areas are around the equator where the sun's rays are most direct, and that produces hot rising air. And air can't rise forever, because there's a very stable layer in the upper, upper atmosphere called the tropopause. And so when that rising air hits that layer, it can't go any farther up. So it starts to spread out. Uh, and it can't stay where it is because there's more warm air rising behind it. So it kind of like getting, if, if you took a, an, a crowded escalator to the top, you can't just, once you get there, stop. Because uh, everyone else would start bumping into you and you'd have to kind of spread out to make way for the people coming up behind you. So that that rising air hits the tropopause, spreads out in both directions, think north and south. And then by the time it hits that polar region, it would be the coldest air. And just like hot air rises, cold, dense air sinks. And so at the north and south pole, you'd get air flowing down. And this is really a classic convection cell, just like you get when you boil water in a pot. Uh, and then we think back to the water cycle where that warm rising air at the equator when it cools in the upper atmosphere, it condenses into clouds and you get rain. But the air itself becomes drier because a lot of that moisture has left it as rain, kind of like if you wring out a towel. So that cold upper spreading air is, is not only cold, it's dry. And that dry air, when it falls onto earth and starts warming up again, it starts to take moisture out of the air. So like if you wring out a towel and it becomes dry, that towel can then start taking on, on water again. So, so now you have uh, cold descending air producing dry desert-like conditions. Uh, and that's kind of the most important takeaway from this illustration. So warm, moist rising air produces rain. Cold, dry descending air results in dry areas, often deserts, which is why the tropics are so rainy and the North and South Poles, uh, even though there's a lot of snow are some of the driest places on earth. So then the reality is a little bit more like this. And if you pay attention mainly to the right side of the diagram, uh, I, hopefully it's also the right side for you, you'll see that you, you have the rising air at the equator and the sinking air at the poles. So that's still here. But because of, of several things, including friction and the rotation and the tilt of the earth, those convection cells don't last all the way to the poles. They're kind of broken up. Um, so just like before, you have hot air rising at the equator, dry air spreading north and south, but then that northward momentum is broken up and the cold, dry air actually sinks back to earth at about 30 degrees. That, that, that's just think of that as a, it's, it's not exactly at 30 degrees. It's, it's a roughly 30 degrees, north and south. Um, and then that falling air doesn't go into the earth. It spreads when it hits the earth. And, and so that falling air also moves north and south. The air that moves south will likely be cycled back up into that tropical cell. But the air that heads north will collide with the air that is driven south by that cold polar air. And when these two masses collide, uh, and, and here in Wisconsin and Massachusetts and Colorado, we're familiar with this. The warm air mass is driven upward, and uh, we know what happens to rising warm, moist air. It produces rain. So if you look at another representation, you see that at the equator and at about 60 degrees, you have rising air with low pressure and lots of precipitation. At the poles and at about 30 degrees, you have falling dry air with high pressure. So when you hear about cold fronts from the north and warm fronts from the south, and you hear about the jet stream, which is actually up in the atmosphere and unstable air, uh, these convection cells are at the heart of what a weather forecaster is talking about, uh, pressure systems and fronts. So the spin and tilt of the earth really complicates these things, but these are the major processes that drive our weather. And I discussed this more 
in my tropical ecology class. And hopefully someday we'll soon, we'll be able to do that again because uh, there's just so much here. But my, my next favorite leap is to go from this image to this image. And just like the model predicts, the wettest areas on earth are right around the equator. So we have the, the warm rising air resulting in the tropical rainforests of Brazil and Ecuador, of Central Africa, Southern India, Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia, Northern Australia. And then like the model says, if you go about 30 degrees North and South, you hit some of the driest areas of the planet. So at 30 degrees north, you have the Sahara, the Arabian deserts, the Gobi, uh, the deserts of Northern Mexico and Southern US. At about 30 degrees south, you have the Kalahari and the Namib in Africa, pretty much all of Australia and the Patagonian desert in South America. If you go to 60 degrees north, you're back to that unstable rising air and that produces wet areas like the temperate rainforests of the Pacific Northwest, the Midwest, New England, same across to Europe and much of Russia. There aren't many land masses at that 60 degrees south for us to compare, but if they were, it'd likely be similar to these temperate areas of the north. And then the Arctic and Antarctic areas, again, are very dry, dominated by that cold, dry, high pressure. So this is one of my favorite patterns to look at. Um, but again, remember the tilt of the earth and the location of the land masses are all contributing to uh, and the, so the boundaries between these layers are also constantly moving when they talk about the jet stream dipping south and things like that. Uh, so those, the 30 and 60 are just kind of approximate markers. Um, but I will show you one last map that I love that looks strictly at rainfall. And, and this shows that the rainfall patterns we see on land also extend into the ocean. And it's actually more evident over water, particularly right along the equator, you have the most rain. So um, really, really cool stuff that I could look at for a long time, but this is an episode on clouds. And essentially you need three ingredients to form a cloud. You need moisture in the air, you need a cooling process, and then you need something for water to condense onto. And that's an interesting ingredient though. The water droplet needs something to form around and that could be dust particles it could be other elements including water it could be ice um, it can even be airborne bacteria which is a a fascinating uh, topic that probably prompts some to wonder if we could get sick from the rain if there's bacteria in it um, a lot of the dust from africa uh, central africa probably pretty much the the the, the desert areas in particular get carried and form clouds and those dust storms come and fall as rain in, in Brazil. Uh, but essentially rain forms most readily when there are particles around which that the water can condense. And this is a simple concept that led to humans experimenting with the idea that if you need rain, you could seed clouds with particles. Or conversely, if you're trying to avoid getting rain, you could see clouds that are on their way to you so that the rain comes out before it gets to you. And we humans have been working on this for a while uh, and it doesn't always go the way we want it to. Uh, the British Royal Air Force seeded clouds in 1952 that led to a terrible flood that killed uh, 35 people, more than 35 people. Um, China in particular has been using silver nitrate in rockets uh, most famously for the Beijing Olympics. And they even have a weather modification office as part of their meteorological bureau. Um, but it'd be, it'd be foolish to think that China is the only country doing this. Uh, I think they just re the, receive the most attention. And then, you know, clouds cross boundaries. So what if you make it rain in another country or you steal rain from another country? So it's, it's probably not good for, for diplomatic relations. So, um, I don't know, this all in all to me seems like a, a, a terrible idea, but back to clouds and rain. Uh, once clouds form, the droplets are usually teeny tiny, like a few microns in diameter. And the droplets are so light that they're held aloft just by the wind and the air currents. Um, so then that leads to the question, what if you don't have rising air, but you still have all those other ingredients to make clouds, well, then your recipe results in fog. And fog is nothing more than a cloud that's on the ground. It's, it's that simple. So 
most commonly occurs when you have warm, moist air at the ground level that's, that's cooled. And it's often cooled when a cold air mass kind of rolls in from the side off of a body of water, which is why fog is most common along coastal temperate areas in particular. So the Great Lakes or the Pacific Northwest uh, or New England or Europe, Japan and other areas. But um, most non-fog clouds are formed by rising air, air. And we know that the sun is the most common driver of rising air, but there are other things that will make air rise. So this is Arenal Volcano in Costa Rica. And um, because when air moves a, across a landscape, it doesn't enter the earth. So any air that runs into this volcano or any other mountain will be pushed upward. And if you're lucky, you, you visit Arenal and you get this view, but more often than not, you get this view. So warm, moist air is forced up the sides of the volcano uh, that cools and condenses at the top. So Arenal pretty much produces its own clouds most of the time, uh, but that's okay. If, if we can't see Arenal, um, let's head over to Denali in Alaska and we'll look at that. Oh, same thing. Uh, now our, uh, Denali is producing its own clouds at the top too. So let's head over to Tanzania and take a look at Mount Kilimanjaro. And you can see that this pattern uh, repeats itself anytime you have a large kind of, especially a singular mountain. And so this brings us to our first classification of clouds. Um, and maybe my favorites of all of them. I don't know, I have, I have a bunch of favorites now that I've been looking into this, but these are called lenticular clouds. And the word lenticular comes from the fact that they're shaped like a lens. And the word lens is actually derived from the lentil bean for its shape. So, uh, so that's any, anything that has a lens shape, it's named so because of the lentil bean. Um, and, we're, and while we're at it, a falling raindrop does not look like this, according to Dr. Storer. Uh, a falling raindrop also takes that lenticular lens or lentil bean shape. So think about that next time you're drawing rain. Um, and you probably didn't realize how important lentil beans were going to be today. So what if that moving air comes across not a single mountain, but a mountain range? Uh, you'll still get clouds, but then they're going to look a little bit more like this. Uh, in fact, mountain ranges are big drivers of local weather and climate, um, causing what's called the, the rain shadow effect. With rain shadows, so mountains cause air to rise. That rising air is cooled. It causes uh, clouds and condensation and precipitation. But then when the air moves over and down the other side, all that moisture had been kind of squeezed out. So the falling warming air is kind of sucking up all that available moisture and causing dry conditions on the other side, just like we saw with those convection cells earlier, uh, except the, the tropical rainforests are kind of that left side of the mountain, and then the deserts are that right side of the mountain. And you'll see this in places like the Andes in South America, and especially in the Northwest of the United States. So I remember taking the Empire Builder to Seattle or Portland uh, and approaching the Cascade Mountain Range from the east and going into a long tunnel that took you under the divide. So going into the tunnel, the landscape up until that point was still pretty barren and dry. But then when we emerged from the tunnel on the west side of the Cascades, it was, we entered this like full on lush, rainy community. It's, it's, it's as if somebody flipped the switch and I was completely blown away. It was, it was as stark as the contrast as you see in this image. So, um, so I think, you know, now that we have a, a decent understanding of how clouds are formed, uh, a cloud is not a cloud is not a cloud. So if we start looking at basic cloud classification, and if you're like me, this is the point where you start getting giddy. Um, so we already mentioned the lenticular clouds, which are, are formed by mountains. And 
and they produce some of the most striking and beautiful formations. Um, this is a, a series of lenticular clouds above Mount Fuji. And you, you, you often get that layering uh, effect of lens. And here's a few more. One looks like a UFO. Um, and, and you can see that they don't have to be at the top of the mountain themselves. They can form above the mountain or they can form and then, of course, drift away from the mountain. Um, but maybe my, maybe my favorite at this point is lenticular lenses. And then we'll move from the spectacular to the drab. And I, I, I think I say that objectively. So stratus clouds, that's what I woke up to in Milwaukee this morning. That's what I'm looking at right now. Um, for those of us in Milwaukee, we're familiar with stratus clouds because uh, we might be under stratus clouds for the entire month of December. Stratus means layered or sheet-like. Think strata or stratum. And when it's, when it's overcast from horizon to horizon, uh, where you're probably dealing with the stratus clouds that give us the seasonal affective disorder and keep the sun away. Stratus clouds form more slowly and over a wider area. So it's often a large body of water that will produce them or large frontal air masses that just have a little less energy in them. Uh, and, and they can dominate an area for quite a while, uh, putting some of us into a funk. Um, although I, I will admit that waking up this morning to see stratus clouds, now that I'm paying closer attention to clouds, it makes it a little more fun and, and interesting and maybe a little less depressing. Um, but stratus can also be used to describe clouds at the lowest levels of the atmosphere, although technically those are called tropospheric clouds. Okay, now the one, oh yeah, go ahead. I have a quick question um, about mountain ranges. Do they need to be a certain height um, for the effect to take place? Um, like how the East Coast mountains don't have the stark contrast between the West and the East. In theory, that's an excellent question. In theory, you don't need a particular height, um, but taller will produce conditions more than others. And you're talking about uh, air masses and the and the the typical way in which they're they're coming, you know, which in which they're arriving. And the air masses are affected by the ocean currents, and so it's it's. It's, a, it's an excellent question because there's not this like this one simple recipe. Um, clouds will form when moisture hits the dew point. That means the, the moisture is going to come out of gas and start uh, being a liquid form. And so there are things that will affect the dew point, uh, including, you know, local climate. Um, it, it'll, it'll be affected by humidity um, and, you know, the orientation of the mountains. So uh, I guess the simple answer is yes, higher clouds will likely produce these more readily, um, but there's a lot of other factors, which I think is what the question is alluding to. There's a lot of other factors that, that play into it. So you could have mountains without clouds. Um, you could have smaller mountains producing wonderful clouds. Um, so that's, uh, that's an excellent question. All right, moving on to the cumulus clouds and, and most of the cloud sources start with this one because I think this is the most fun, uh, sometimes called the, the convective ones. They're familiar. They're the, the clouds that, are, that, that start off the Simpsons episodes, these, these white fluffy clouds that take the shape of familiar objects. Um, and uh, unlike cirrus clouds, which form very slowly over a broad area, cumulus clouds form more quickly. They have higher energy and it's, it's usually in response to local conditions. So they tend to be smaller, um, but small is a very relative term because an average cumulus cloud weighs, are you ready for this? About one, more than a million pounds, about 1.1 million pounds. So the average cumulus cloud weighs about the same as a hundred elephants. Uh, cumulus means heap and uh, those, 100 elephants are kept in the air by uh, the fact that they're very small individually, the droplets and, and the air currents. Uh, so these are the, the cotton candy, the puffy cauliflowery clouds. Um, 
And Dr. Storr also wanted to remind people that while you're drawing your raindrops now in their true form, you should also remember that the fluffiness of clouds only happens at the top. So the flat, they're flat on the bottom, puffy on the top. So if you're drawing a fluffy cloud, don't draw those bumps on the bottom. Keep it flat, people. And uh, so now it, we, we already have enough vocabulary now that we can start combining these terms. So what do you get when you cross a cumulus uh, cloud and a stratus cloud? You get a stratocumulus cloud and kind of looks like what you'd expect if you cross the two. You have some, some areas that are kind of flatter and larger, and you have some areas that are puffy. And in the daytime, these stratocumulus clouds look pretty normal, but at night, they're, they're the ones that kind of produce that really fun full moon effect when the moon kind of peeks out from behind the clouds, which you know are kind of going by. Clouds can, can move at you know 50 or 60 miles an hour. Um, and uh, so depending on the speed of the clouds, the moon will kind of show up or go behind the clouds. And that, of course, affects uh, the werewolves and, and other things. So it's, it's pretty important. But uh, so that is stratocumulus. You probably heard the, the term nimbus in clouds. And nimbus simply means rain. So nimbus is rainstorm. So uh, nimbus clouds are simply another name for rain clouds. So a cumulus cloud becomes a cumulonimbus cloud once it starts producing rain. And most rain comes from cumulus clouds because they're the ones that form quickly due to that rising unstable air. Uh, they form quickly, they produce intense thunderstorms and can be pretty dangerous. So it, it is important to pay attention to what's happening, happening particular with uh, cumulus clouds and large intense Cumulonimbus clouds often take on the shape of an anvil and, and are even called anvil clouds sometimes. Uh, so these intense clouds kind of just bubble up quickly. They grow so quickly that even though they started at a, at a low layer, they reach all the way up to that tropopause layer we were talking about earlier. And because the air doesn't hit that, it doesn't go through that tropopause, it spreads. And so that's where you get that, that anvil shape. The, the air goes so quickly, so fast, so high, and it hits that layer and it spreads out. Um, and, and this is probably a good, since these are these produce the most types of precipitation, uh, we can talk a little bit about the, the types of precipitation that can come from clouds. So uh, the water droplets can start as water, they can start as ice, they can switch between the two, and they can switch as they're, as they're falling. So regardless of what happens on the way down, if it's water when it hits the land, we call it rain. If it's <clears throat> very cold water that hits the ground and there's cold air, uh, it may hit the ground and then freeze. So we call that freezing rain. It hit the ground wet, but then froze right away. If it melts in the air and then refreezes before it hits the ground, we call it sleet. If it's freezing all the way down, it's just snow. But if it melts and then refreezes, we call it sleet. Um, and if you ever look at those giant clouds, and sometimes you may see a slightly greenish glow, and you're thinking, uh-oh, uh, you may be looking at hail. And what happens with hail is super interesting. It's, it's, it's uh, water particles that start off small and get bigger, and they melt and they refreeze and they melt, but they do that over and over again because there's so many intense updrafts that even as they get heavy, they stay up in the air. And so they might cycle up in the air. And as they're doing that, they're getting bigger and bigger. And, and the air is so intense that it can keep those golf ball sized uh, hail balls, they can keep them up and, and stay up. And then at some point they get so big that the updrafts can't keep them up and then they fall. And then you get, you know, really big uh, hail uh, droplets. You get, you know, the golf ball size hail or the softball size hail or bigger um, because they eventually get so heavy after being just kind of, uh, you know, tossed around in the cloud over and over again and, and building that uh, then they fall and they find a way to, to, to land on our roofs and our cars and hopefully not us. Hey, Tim. Yeah. Do you know how 
clouds were weighed? Like how? how yeah, been? I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't know who put a cloud on a scale, um, <laughs> but I would imagine that you know water droplets have weight, and uh, I would imagine maybe somebody else knows this that you know if if you do the calculations and you know, maybe you start with fog on the ground and, and figure out how much water there is per square foot. And, um, you know, if you condense that water, it, it will have weight, even, you know, if you can't keep it in the air, and then you can do the calculations by how big the average uh, cumulus cloud is. But uh, yeah, that's a, a really, really good question. So, um, so anvil clouds produce, um, what I had on my background today, and maybe, I don't know, maybe my second favorite cloud at this point, and they're called mamatis clouds. These often happen on the underside of anvil clouds. It doesn't have to be anvil though. It's derived from Latin uh, mamma, which means udder or breast. And they're likely caused by these kind of icy downdrafts that are happening within that maelstrom of the clouds. Uh, and it, and um, it's, it's produced in these really intense cumulonimbus clouds that often lead to heavy storms, but they, they can form in other types of clouds. And they're not technically a type of cloud, they're classified as a supplementary formation uh, that forms from other clouds. But I don't know, whatever you, however you classify them, they're amazing. And here's some more mamatis clouds. Uh, and you can just see how stunning they are and also how scary they are. So I, I might just freak out a little bit if I were looking up at these clouds. All right, so we have to go back to the boring stratus clouds, but uh, stratus clouds like cumulus clouds, once they produce rain, they become nimbostratus clouds. And they, unlike that intensity in the cumulonimbus, Nimbostratus tends to produce these long, steady rains, these drizzles that can go on for days and days. Um, they're fairly featureless. It just kind of looks like the, the sky and the clouds are all one. There's no layer. It's just that kind of grayish haze. Uh, but it, it is a type of cloud that's important. But let's go back to the cumulus because they're more fun. Uh, there's something called pyrocumulus. And pyro is the root word for fire. And uh, so like the cumulus clouds we talked about early, they form quickly from rising heat. But in this case, the source of the rising heat is from fires themselves instead of the energy from the sun. So that's where the, the name pyro comes for, from. And they too can take on a very ominous, dark look. Uh, pyrocumulus clouds can also then turn into pyrocumulonimbus clouds once they start producing rain. And they can even produce thunderstorms. So I think it's a little strange to think of fire causing rain, but it happens. Uh, and again, the only difference here is that the rising hot air is caused by the fire. And you can see that, you can see in this illustration, the pyrocumulus turning into pyrocumulonimbus. Uh, but you can also see the smoke particles, which are essentially seeding that cloud. Uh, and so fire produces smoke, smoke turns into a cloud, cloud produces rain. Super interesting. Another way that we classify clouds is by their altitude. And so the, the standard cumulus and stratus clouds we looked at are typically at the lowest levels. Um, even though, like I said, cumulus clouds can reach all the way to the upper limits, we do classify them by the lower edge. So the clouds that either form in or migrate to the very highest levels of the atmosphere between 20 and 40,000 feet are called cirrus clouds. They're the most distant from our perspective. They tend to be delicate and wispy, uh, and they tend to have these little swirls at the end that's created by the wind uh, in the upper reaches of the atmosphere, much like how coyote scat has the little swirls at the end. If, uh, if a cumulus cloud forms above 20,000 feet, then it's called a cirro cumulus or a high cumulus cloud. And it's kind of like you'd expect. It's these cumulus clouds that look very far away and much smaller. And then we also have the cirro stratus clouds or stratus clouds that are very far away in the upper atmosphere. They tend to be wispier than the ground level cirrus, um, which are that, that thick horizon to horizon. And those still can be really large patches, but they're so far away that they just look smaller. 
And then there's the middle level of clouds that have the prefix alto for uh, clouds that form between 6,500 feet and 20,000 feet. So here we have alto cumulus. And because they're now closer, they tend to have a little bit more texture and starting to look a little bit more like our regular cumulus clouds. And then you have the alto stratus clouds, which are a bit heavier than the cirro stratus clouds from our perspective, and will actually block the sun and provide you with shade if they pass over. But uh, again, they're, they're not as thick as the sun blocking lower stratus clouds. And which uh, leads me to a PSA. If you think that clouds are making it safe for you to go outside with exposed skin, about 80% of the harmful UV rays pass right through the clouds. So you still do need to protect your skin. There are over 40 cloud classifications. Um, so I do have to stop somewhere. In fact, there are three different species of cumulus clouds. There's five different species of stratocumulus clouds, uh, but we'll just end with a couple uh, more of the irregular favorites, starting with these, which are the hole punch clouds, or sometimes called fall street clouds. And we think this happens when some sort of disturbance, uh, such it could be an airplane, it could be something else, uh, causes a chain of events where ice, ice crystals form locally. Uh, and, and then the ice crystals are much less visible to us than the water droplets in the surrounding clouds. These are called Kelvin Hemholtz formations, which can form when the air masses between boundaries become unstable, and then they produce these kind of ocean wave like formations. And finally, there's a great story in the New York Times, and I'll send you the link, but it tells the story of Gavin. Predator Pinney and how his fascination with clouds led to the start of the Cloud Appreciation Society, which started kind of on a whim, um, not too seriously, but then gained a huge following. And it's definitely worth the read and a visit to the website. And there's a book. Um, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll send you that information. But the article centers around his desire to get these clouds, uh, which he calls asparatus clouds, classified as a new cloud formation and the struggles that he has with the cloud establishment. Um, so there's a lot of different types of clouds. Uh, some are some kind of glow at night. There's uh, a new type of, of cloud formation that we think happened after Krakatoa because of some particles that went and stayed in the upper atmosphere, so probably weren't around before uh, it erupted. But we will finish here with a mention of a pharmacist by the name of Luke Howard, who at 20 years old, and I'm trying to think of what I was doing when I was 20, but at 20 years old, he came up with the classification system of clouds that we still use today, more than 200 years later. This was in 1803. Uh, in fact, he was the first person to use the word cloud. Previously, they were called essences um, and really hadn't been given much thought uh, at least by the Western scientific community. So uh, I don't know, clouds, it, it's just so hard to, to, to pick the cloud stories, but you know, they, they affect your mood, they make skies bigger, they add color, they add intrigue, they warn us of danger, danger that lures some of us closer to see the storms, to witness or, or even chase storms, or for others, they warn us to hide in our basement. And according to Predator Penny, clouds are not something to moan about. They are, in fact, the most dynamic, evocative, and poetic aspect of nature. And it's almost as if he were writing the tagline for this Backyard Naturalist series when he wrote, it's much better for our souls to realize we can be amazed and delighted by what's around us. So thank you for joining me today. I will stop sharing my screen.